Today, uh, in an age where citizens are supposedly increasingly dissatisfied, political parties see their memberships uh, decrease and more and more people are so-called leaving the, uh, the traditional political arena, so-called citizen engagement has become an important topic. At the same time, uh, we notice that more and more citizens question elites. They have become more vocal, they reject their behavior, their opinions, even their motivations. So we see a real dissatisfaction with political elites or even politics more general. Citizens in that regard, they want a bigger voice, they want to be heard. Um, with that in mind, the, the notion of unmediated citizen participation is becoming more and more uh, relevant. Perhaps one of the more renowned or straightforward manners to do that is through uh, direct democracy. To discuss this in a bit more depth and to gain a bit of a better understanding about this, I'm having a conversation today with Christoph, ja Christoph Jacobs uh, about this. So first of all, Christoph, to start off at the beginning, can you tell us a little bit what is direct democracy uh, in and of itself? Yes, so direct democracy is, is one of these models of democracy where citizens directly participate in, in policy making. Now, um, there are different kinds of ways of doing that. So what we typically do is we, we mostly define direct democracy by looking at the instruments that it comprises. Um, and in the past, there um, basically were two types of instruments uh, that belonged to this cluster of uh, direct democracy. And that was uh, recall elections um, and referendums in their different forms. Now, recall elections are a bit strange, obviously, because that's part of representative democracy. Um, if you're dissatisfied with, with a governor or um, uh, uh, somebody who is in, exec in an executive position, um, telling uh, him or her, okay, it's time to, to re revisit our, our choice there and uh, we want you out and vote again. That's actually part of representative democracy. So in more um, recent uh, conceptualizations of direct democracy, it's basically just referendums in all their forms. All right, so oftentimes this kind of, these tools of direct democracy, referenda, or, or in general, they're correctly or incorrectly perceived or at least portrayed as a tool of populists. So why would we expect there to be some kind of at least theoretical relationship between populism on the one hand and direct democracy or referenda on the other hand? Yeah. Yeah. So, so basically, if you look at this, um, this definition of, of populism, and I know this is a very controversial thing, um, the definition of populism, but basically what, what people always say is that substantively speaking, uh, populism or the set of ideas that is called populism comprises of at least two and perhaps even four elements. So the anti-elitism, uh, that's one element or one dimension. The other one is the, the people centrism. Uh, so populists, uh, um, they, they uh, are fans of the pure people. Um, and then there's, there's two elements where there's uh, less consensus and that is the Manichean worldview, the black and white, good versus mm -hmm. evil part and the popular sovereignty part. Uh, the people should have power, basically. Or politics uh, should be an emanation of uh, the, the general will. Um, and leaving that Manichean uh, part aside, what you see is that direct democracy is, it fits very well with the three dimensions there. So it's anti-elitist uh, in the sense that referendums are a means of, of keeping these elites, the politicians, in check, basically. They are a corrective to representative democracy there. Um, they're people-centered because they, they are uh, mostly, they're, they're asking people to vote on certain policy, right? So it, it gives, it's about citizens and what they think. And then there's a, the popular sovereignty part um, and it indeed empowers citizens in, at the expense of, of elites. So what you see is that there's, there's a big fit between um, the elements of populism and direct democracy. So it makes sense that citizens who adhere to this set of populist ideas would be a, a fan of referendums. And then there's also the second element, and that is that these populist parties uh, also tend to be fans of referendums. So for instance, Geert Wilders in, in one of the, the last elections, he had this very short party manifesto, it was just one page. And obviously, mostly it was about, about nativism uh, and, and migrants and Muslims. But there was this very prominent element as well, and that was, we're going to give the people power by referendums. So populist parties themselves also are associated with referendums. Okay, so 
your research mostly focuses specifically on, on this connection, right, between uh, referenda and, and populism, but more specifically applied to the demand, to the demand side. So meaning yeah. the connection or how populist attitudes relate to citizens' preferences for their direct democratic tools or, or, or preferences for referenda. So on an individual level, why yeah. should we expect there to be some kind of connection? Why should citizens who are more populist to be related to higher preferences uh, for a direct democracy. Yeah, yeah, that is true. Um, and, and that is partly a, a personal preference of mine. Uh, so in the beginning, I, I studied populist parties as well and, and how they relate themselves to democratic reforms. Um, and it turns out that they're mostly strategic in that part. When they are in opposition, they favor instruments of, of, of citizen participation that basically make the government's life difficult. Mm -hmm. But once they are in office, eh, they tend to care less. Um, and if they do it, um, they, they only do it uh, on topics that they're sure to win. And if they lose, they tend to ignore the outcome or be very sore losers, to, be, to say the very least. So in that sense, I thought mm, there's, there's not much interesting that we can, can study there. Uh, but it becomes different when you look at citizens. Um, because there's, there's a broad group of citizens um, that uh, seems to be, well, they, 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 they believe that um, their voice is not listened to. And the difference between citizens and parties is obviously that populism cannot be used in a strategic way, as in they don't need to be elected because they are the citizens. Now, you could say they could use referendums to advance their policy preferences. Now, that's an interesting question, right? So do they only want referendums when uh, they believe that the, the majority of the people or the people in general is aligned with what they think? But more in general, populism is not a rhetorical style or it, it's less uh, straightforward that it's a strategy for citizens. So I was very much interested in that. What happens if it's not just this rhetorical stuff mm -hmm. uh, or, or a strategy? So what, is your, what are your findings from your research? Like what, what do we see empirically speaking uh, uh, about this connection? Is, is that theoretical connection that we would expect? Is it actually effectively there? Yeah, so it's very interesting. There's lots of survey data um, that has appeared in the recent years. So when, once uh, survey data sets, uh, survey questionnaires started including the items of the, the populist attitude scale, um, and what you see is that the support for referendums is, is always um, significantly linked with, with populist attitudes. So basically, the higher your degree of populist attitudes, uh, the more you tend to support, more likely you are supportive of referendums. But the thing is that these preferences, okay, that's just one part of it. But what happens when push comes to shove and there is an actual referendum? <laughs> Do these populist citizens or citizens with a higher degree of populist attitudes, I'll just abbreviate it as uh, populist citizens. Do they, are they more likely to turn out if there is an actual referendum? And what do they vote? Um, and the interesting thing is that, well, basically what we see is that they're not more likely to vote, to turn out to vote. So there is this populist participation paradox, uh, to, to use a term that my colleague Matthias Rodan uh, coined, and it's, it seems that they're very much a fan of referendums, but when there's an actual referendum, eh, they seem to, well, not turn out and can't be bothered to, to vote. And, and that's one of the puzzles that we're still uh, investigating. Now, regarding what they vote, there's not that much studies out there. Uh, our own study suggests that in the 2016 uh, Ukraine referendum in the Netherlands, they were far more likely to vote against the elite. And that makes sense that they use a referendum against the elites. But the funny thing is that relationship actually even holds if you control for party choice uh, of party preference, uh, because we know that party cues are very important in referendums. Mm -hmm. um, and it actually even also holds if you control for the substantive preferences of these voters. Uh, and basically the, the implication of that is that if you're organizing a referendum as a government and you're in a country with a high or a very large group of citizens with a high degree of populist attitudes, almost inevitably, you're going to lose that referendum because there is this group that will vote against the elite mm -hmm. no matter what. 
All right, so all of this specifically relates to citizens' preferences for referenda, right? Yep. So, but there's other democratic innovations out there, tools of direct democracy. So uh, we're not only limited to referenda. So could you tell us a little bit about that and how these other tools of direct democracy might relate back to, to populist attitudes? Yep. Yeah, so there's there's different models of, of democracy. You have direct democracy, but you also have deliberative democracy. Uh, and in the UK, for instance, um, you have um, these uh, citizens assemblies on mm -hmm. topics such as Brexit uh, or climate change. In Belgium as well. In Belgium as well. In Belgium, we actually have uh, in, in uh, the, the Brussels uh, region uh, and in the eastern part of, of Belgium, where there are what no less than 70,000 German speaking uh, citizens. At least. Yeah. At least, at least. Um, and they have these permanent citizens assemblies or, or mini publics. Um, so, so they are entrenched there. So what you see is that this is slowly spreading around the globe. Uh, you also have Macron with his uh, citizens assembly on climate change. Um, and in the Netherlands, they also want to, or at least they're thinking about uh, introducing another citizens assembly after the 2006 one on electoral systems. Mm -hmm. um, and basically the, what distinguishes referendums or direct democracy from deliberative democracy is that you have a smaller group of citizens that come together to not just express their opinion on policy by casting a vote, but to exchange ideas um, and to come to, ideally, according to the political philosophers or theorists, a consensus but in practice often a compromise where the different points of view are um, included. Uh, it's typically a smaller group of citizens ranging from say 30 citizens to 150 or even a thousand. Um, uh, you, you have in Belgium, for instance, a G thousand. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the idea was to, to get a thousand citizens together to uh, think about the, the future of Belgium. Now, that's a very interesting and very complex topic. Um, and I think around, if I remember it correctly, around 700 citizens uh, turned out. But this is really exchanging uh, point of views and deliberating. And what you see is that typically uh, citizens start from their, their own position and then move to the, the more um, the, the public concerns that are um, in the general interest. And why would we expect there to be some kind of connection between these kind of deliberative democracy or these the, the engagement in, in deliberative democracy and populism itself. Well, in fact, we wouldn't expect that. And that's really interesting because, uh, as, as you see, um, with, with deliberative democracy, it's about exchanging point of view. So the, the starting point is that we live in a pluralist society, um, not, not a society where there is just one people. So that and stands every, very much against what exactly. populism stands for, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So the homogenous people, I mean, that's, that's completely at odds with the starting point mm -hmm. uh, of deliberative democracy. I mean, if, if the people is homogenous, why on earth would you need to bring them together to exchange views and then move to this, this general consensus or compromise? So it's completely at odds. Uh, so you, you wouldn't expect citizens with a high degree of populist attitudes to be fans of deliberative democracy. You wouldn't expect and that. Is that also what you're finding? Uh, no. And that's really fascinating <laughs> what you see is that there is a relatively strong uh, relationship between the degree of populist attitudes and deliberative democracy. And it's really fascinating. I mean, you could say maybe this is real. Maybe they do like deliberative democracy. I mean, it is thinking about decision making by the people. So it is somewhat linked to people centrism, even though it's a different conception of who the people are and, and what their, uh, their characteristic is. Um, you might say, well, it's citizens and it's not the elite, uh, but in any case, uh, it's very tricky. It could be that something else, that this is just an artifact of the fact that the respondents of the service didn't really understand what the liberty of democracy was. It's very mm -hmm. difficult to operationalize that. Um, and interestingly, if you, I mean, th that's actually likely, but even if you, you basically put them in such a mini public, what we find is that they're actually quite happy with it. So they might not have known what it was, but once they're there and they participate, they're actually quite happy with it. Um, so that's interesting. Um, and another explanation that is often given is that um, basically it could also be 
uh, a sign of that basically the idea that the grass is green anything is better than representative democracy or in the netherlands anything is better than mark rutte and his government mm -hmm. even if it's this crazy mini public um it might not be the referendum that we want but at least it's not mark rutte so the, the grass is greener is is, is one uh, likely explanation as well all right, so to try and kind of zoom out then again, you indicated earlier that populists might be sore losers uh, in that regard. Could you elaborate a little bit on that and, and what, did, what do you mean exactly by that? How, why are you putting forward that particular yeah. phrase or hypothesis? Yeah. So when we do research on populist uh, attitudes among citizens, quite often we are inspired by the findings of populist parties and populist politicians. Mm -hmm. um, because there's, there's not that much theorizing about how, uh, how citizens with a high degree of populist attitudes would react and behave, basically. Um, so when we look at, at populist politicians, um, one of the things that we see is that when it comes to referendums, they tend to be very much sore losers. Uh, Chavez is a very nice uh, case in point, for instance, who lost one referendum. Um, he accepted the outcome, but pushed through several of the elements of uh, the, the policy package that was on the, on the referendum ballot, uh, nevertheless, and he punished several people who um, spoke out against uh, his, his reform package. So when we look at populist politicians, we expect, we see that they, they tend to be sore losers. They have difficulties with losing. So that's why we thought, okay, this might be the same with citizens when they lose, uh, popular citizens when they lose. But interestingly, and we're, we're currently doing that research based on the referendum data set that we have for a Dutch referendum in 2018. And what we find is that this is not the case. In fact, citizens with a high degree of populist attitudes um, tend to be less likely to be uh, sore losers than citizens who do not have a high degree of populist attitudes. This is an interesting finding. And we believe it might be due to the fact that if you are somebody who, is, who has a very low degree of populist attitudes, um, you're also very likely to not be a fan of referendums to begin with. And if you lose that referendum that you're not a fan of, obviously you're less likely to accept that outcome. Mm -hmm. Now, the losing is partly offset by these citizens with a high degree of populist attitudes by the fact that they're very much fans of referendums. They didn't get the outcome that they wanted, but at least they got the process that they wanted. And that is what we're currently thinking explains this finding. But clearly, this, this merits more research. But it's, it's fascinating. We often think that, that populist citizens are basically mini-Trumps. But that's not always the case. In fact, it's often not the case. And that's intriguing. What are the differences between populist citizens and populist politicians? There, there seem to be many. All right, so if, if we take some of these observations that you've made in your research and we take some of the, let's call them conundrums that come out of the, the research. And if we think about A, the state of current democracy, right? A lot of people are arguing that democracy is under pressure in a lot of countries. Yep. And B, we look at the kind of seeming persistence of populism across Europe. How do we put your findings in comparison with those two uh, evolutions? In other words, what should we take away uh, from your research? What, what are the implications or the, the meaning of it? What's the larger scale? Uh, how should we think about it? Yeah, so quite often what you see is that this, this uh, call for democratic reform, for democratic innovation is linked to the democratic malaise or the erosion of democracy mm -hmm. as you're, you're uh, outlining it. Um, an interesting thing is that our findings suggest that, yeah, there might be something to it. It's pretty clear that citizens in general desire to be listened to and mm -hmm. desire to have more voice. Uh, and this holds especially or even a fortiori for these citizens that are uh, having a high degree of populist attitudes. Uh, and sometimes it seems to work but that's not always the case. Um, and the interesting thing is that it could also backfire. Um, and what we saw, for instance, in the 2016 referendum in the Netherlands is that populist citizens especially were very disappointed with the reaction of the elites to the outcome of that referendum. They felt actually that they weren't heard. So it could amplify this feeling or make it even bigger of dissatisfaction with the way democracy works. Now, on the other hand, there are also citizens who are satisfied, and it seems to depend on how the, the elites, the government, react. 
And this is interesting because typically in democratic innovations literature, the assumption seems to be either it's good or it has no effect. Okay. But in fact, what we see is that it can have a good effect, a positive effect, it can have a neutral effect, but also a negative effect. It can backfire depending on certain contextual factors, but also the reaction of the elites to the outcome. And yeah, this means that if you want to do it, if you want to implement democratic innovations, be aware of these factors or it can backfire. And that's obviously not uh, what these reformers wanted to begin with. All right, that's a very interesting takeaway for this, Christoph. Thank you very much for taking the time to enlighten us on this very interesting uh, research topic. My pleasure.